Well, why don't we pray and ask God to uh, give us understanding of this passage. Let's do that. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your great truths. And we thank you for the great truth that Christ came for his sheep, his church, his people, that he came to save us. Lord, help us to understand this. Help us to rejoice in it. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I know it's Valentine's Day, and it made me think that many years ago, I stood getting married, and I stood up the front. Now, for any of you that have ever got married, you know how that goes. You have eyes for one woman. I wasn't standing up the front of the church saying, ladies, thank you for coming. I do love you all, and I hope there's at least one of you out there that loves me. I was saying, Dina, I love you. Marriage is a very personal, specific kind of love. Now, throughout church history, one of the debates that many Christians have had is when we are talking about the love of Christ expressed in the cross, how specific or how broad is that love? Some have said it's a broad love that Jesus died for the whole world, that his atoning love extends to each and every person. Others have said it's a more personal love. He died for his sheep. His atoning love extended to a smaller group, his flock. Well, here's what I want to suggest this morning. While the Bible does teach that God, Father, Son and Spirit, does have a broad love, a love for the world, That love is expressed in ways of common grace, not destroying us for our rebellion, giving us food to eat, uh, keeping us from annihilating each other. But the Bible also teaches that there is a narrow, more personal, more specific love, a saving love. Father, Son and Spirit work together not to save everyone in the world, but to save a specific group of people. Now, Scripture calls that group by many names, calls them his people, the elect, the sheep, the church. And Scripture likens this love as the love of a husband for his bride or a shepherd for his sheep. So this morning, I do want to talk about just how personal the love of Christ expressed in the cross is. Did he come to die for me Or did he come to die for every single person? Now, viewing the cross as more personal and specific, it has what I can only call an unfortunate name that tells you almost nothing about it. It's called limited atonement. However, viewing the cross as broader and not specific, I've got to tell you, it has an equally unfortunate name, unlimited atonement. Well, I hold to limited atonement. And this morning, I want to share why the doctrine of a limited atonement is very precious to me. And the reason it is, is that limited atonement proclaims that Christ's love for me is without limit. Limited atonement proclaims that Christ's love for me is without limit. Jesus is my shepherd. He is my saviour. He came for me. He sought me. He died for me. He redeemed me. In every way... I am his. His love for me is not a politician telling a crowd, I love you all, or in Koisty speak, I love you all. It's a bridegroom telling his bride, I love you. Now, I hope this message helps you come to love this doctrine as much as I do. But I do want to stress that wherever you end up on this, this is a debate among brothers and sisters, friends, allies. It's a difference within the church. Now, I want to address the subject this morning by looking at three points. What limited atonement is, why limited atonement is questioned, and why limited atonement matters. First, what is limited atonement? I thought long and hard, how do I get this across to you? And I thought perhaps the best way to frame it would be to ask you a question. If you were God... Which would bring you the most glory? Here's four choices. Sending Jesus to die for the full sins of every person ever born, basically saving everyone. Sending Jesus to die as par payment for the sins of every person ever born. 
sending Jesus to die to offer payment for the full sins of every person ever born, or sending Jesus to die for the full sins of his chosen people. Now, I don't know about you, but there is something deep within me that wants to say, if I were God, I'd do the first one. If I were God and I could save everybody, I'd save every single person. But I'm going to let you in on a secret. I'm not God, and neither are you. While we might think this is what God should do, the Bible is very clear this is not what God did do. He did not save every single person. He could have, he didn't. There will be people in hell. So one way or another, Jesus' death did not save everyone. Despite what we might think, this simply cannot be what brings God the most glory. The second option is simply not possible. The Bible's very clear. No one gets into heaven with any sin baggage. Part payment of sin gets no one in. And yet there are going to be people in heaven, so this is not possible. So the options before us are options three and options four. And these are the options regarding the atonement found in the two major schools, Calvinism and Arminianism, the ways of understanding salvation. And you've been hearing about this for weeks, so I should be asking you about it, but by now I think you understand that the teachings of Arminianism can be uh, summarised like this. Partial depravity, conditional election, unlimited atonement, resistible grace, dependence on the saints, and Calvinism is generally known in this way. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints, better known by the first letters there, TULIP. Now, here's what I, I freely admit. Unless you've done a lot of thinking and a lot of reading, those names probably mean little to you. And even after hearing four sermons on it, you're probably still scratching your head going, I'm still not quite sure of the difference. So I'm going to give you my attempt to clarify these differences. Both of these theological schools are ways to systematize what the Bible says about salvation. Basically, they're saying, how does an unsaved person become a saved person? And in particular, they talk about what is the role of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in turning a, an unsaved person into a saved person. Now, if you're listening carefully when Roy preached, it's probably that first one that the major difference begins in. What are the limits on fallen, sinful humanity in terms of our ability to choose? Now... If you were listening, you would have heard Roy say this. Both groups say very clearly we do have some form of free will in a number of areas. I got to choose what colour socks I wore this morning. I got to choose who I married. I got to choose what colour car I drive. Both groups are united. Sin is our choice and therefore our responsibility. The difference is in terms of our ability to choose faith in Christ. Arminianism, as you have heard, says that God gives us something. They call it provenient grace, and it enables us to now be able to choose faith in Christ. Many still won't, but some can and do. Calvinism says our fallen nature is such we're utterly unable to choose faith, Unless God gives us, with, gives us with faith, we will never choose him. And when God gives us with faith, we irresistibly choose him. Now, how you understand that affects everything else. So here's how I understand it. Arminianism says because we're able to choose, what happens is the Father chooses those who choose, but the Son comes to die for everybody and make it possible to choose, and the Spirit draws those who choose, and of course, if you can choose, you can unchoose, you're only provisionally chosen. Got it? Calvinism says, nah, we're unable to choose. And since we can't choose, God does it for us, he chooses. And the son comes to die for those the father chose. The spirit draws those the father chose. And because it's all of God, we are irrevocably chosen. Notice as well, 
In Calvinism, the purposes of the Trinity, Father, Son and Spirit are in perfect accord. In Arminianism, they don't. Uh, in Arminianism, the Trinity seems to be out of sync with their purposes. Now, having said that, let me narrow it down to the atonement, the cross of Christ. Arminianism says, we believe in an unlimited atonement. The Son dies for all. He came to die for everybody. Calvinism, limited atonement, says this, the Son came to die just for his people. Now, at this point, many of you out there are going, does it really matter? Isn't this a bit like how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Look, let me say, it is not a salvation issue. We're not going to divide over it. But it is an important debate because it affects how you view God, what is ultimately important to God, and it affects how you view what happened at the cross and, in particular, how personal what happened at the cross is. Now, sometimes it's really hard to grasp the difference, so I'm going to give you an illustration. Let me give you a caveat right up front. Every illustration I use today, since we're talking about a divine mystery, it's imperfect, but it might give you an idea of the nuances of the atonement. I want you to imagine there's four young men, and they're arrested for raping and murdering a young girl. They've confessed. They are sentenced to death. However, the law in the society you happen to live in says that if sufficient restitution is paid to the victim's family, the guilty can be forgiven and released. As it just so happens to turn out, these same four young men are the very young men that you and your wife were considering for adoption. And your wife says, what those boys did was wrong, so wrong. But hey, they're going to be our sons. We got the money. You go get our boys. So you head down to the courthouse. You've got your checkbook in your back pocket and you're ready to bail them out. Now, let me tell you how these two different atonement views work out. Here's how unlimited atonement works out. A few hours later, you arrive home and your wife says, where's our boys? Well, honey, we just have to trust that they will do the right thing. You see, I do not want to pay the bail for the ones uh, who don't want to be a part of our family. I only want to pay it for those who want to be a part, who choose to be part of our family. So here's what I did. I left four letters and four checks. The letters said, if you want to be our son, if you admit your guilt, if you agree not to break the law again, if you agree to get an honest job, then your name will be put on a check, your redemption payment will be made, you will be released, and we will adopt you as sons. Your wife says, ooh, you think any of them are actually going to take up that offer? I don't know, but I really hope they all do. Four hours later, you hear two of the boys accepted your offer. They're released, and you adopt them as sons. Here's how limited atonement works. Your wife says, look... We know none of those boys wanted to be a part of our family, but Jack and Brent, we thought that we could really help them. We decided to adopt them. We'd chosen to love them. You go get our boys. You arrive a few hours later and your wife says, where are our boys? And you open the door and there is Jack and Brent, redeemed, free, ready to become sons. One view makes redemption possible if the person accepts it, the other view actually achieves redemption, but only for the ones to whom it is directed. Now, if you understood that, you'll understand what I'm about to say next. Whichever view you take, there are limits on the atonement. Either it's limited in its effect. It only makes salvation possible with a caveat, if they believe, if they choose. It requires faith. Or it's limited in its intent. It's only directed towards some. It's directed towards those the Father chooses. So having said all of that, how would I define limited atonement? I think you have to understand it in the whole context of redemption. So here's, in my understanding, what redemption is. In his sovereign purposes, the Father intended to redeem those people he gave to the Son in eternity past. At the cross, the Son was united to his chosen people and died to pay for their penalty in full. 
the Spirit made these chosen people live and called them into faith. Thus, the plan of redemption saved everyone it was intended for. Limited atonement deals with the Son and his work on the cross. So that's the underlying bits. At the cross, the Son was united to his chosen people and died to pay their penalty in full. The plan of redemption saved everyone it was intended for. Jesus died for his people and everyone that he came for, he saved and none are lost. Now I want to end this first point by quoting from John Owen. He famously showed why this is the only form of salvation that's consistent. Here's what he said. The son underwent punishment for either all the sins of all men, all the sins of some men, or some of the sins of all men. In which case it may be said that if the last be true, all men have some sins to answer for, and so none are saved. That if the second be true, then Christ in their stead suffered for all the sins of all the elect in the whole world, and this is the truth. But if the first be the case, why are not all men free from the punishment due unto their sins? Oh, you answer, because of unbelief. I ask, well, is this unbelief a sin or is it not? If it be, then Christ suffered the punishment due unto it, or he did not. If he did, why must that hinder them more than their other sins for which he died? If he did not, he did not die for all their sins. Now, I know I'm just chucked that up there, and you probably have to read it ten times to get it. But when you do read it and get it, you understand the Arminian position is inconsistent. You can't say what sends us to hell is unbelief, but at the same time, Jesus died for all sin, including that sin. Second point to discuss, and this is the, the really hard one, why limited atonement is questioned. Now, I've suggested the Bible paints a consistent, unified account of the cross being designed to save the people that God chose. So the question before us is, why isn't every Christian on the limited atonement bandwagon? Well, here's what I believe are the two main reasons. There are different interpretations of certain scriptures and there are different ways to protect God's glory. Now, before I look at this, I want to say this as clearly as I can. I know Arminians and Calvinists are often pictured as enemies at war. Truth is, no, they're, they're allies, they're brothers, but with different perspectives. We start with this. There are different interpretations of certain scriptures. Now, we have to address this. In my understanding, the plan of God was always to save a specific people. Now, I think there are so many passages dealing with this. There are so many passages that says the Father chose a specific people. Let me give you just one. Ephesians 1, 4-7. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself. In him, we, those he chose and predestined, have redemption through his blood. Then there are so many scriptures. This was the really big bit that I had spent so long cutting down. There are so many passages that say, says, the son came and died just for this people, the ones the father gave him. Matthew 1.21 is one example. You are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Or another one, Acts 20, 28, shepherd the church of God, which he purchased. He purchased the church with his blood. Now, there are so many scriptures I could point to. So what's the issue? Well, everyone agrees that there are scriptures that say Jesus died for me. The question before us is, are there other scriptures that say, yeah, 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 but he also died for the world? He died for the world in one way, paying a potential ransom for everybody, and he died specifically for those who choose him. Now, again, I want to be as clear as I can about this. Does Jesus love the world? Absolutely. Does he love everyone in the world in a saving, salvific sense? My answer is no, no. If his saving love actually extended to every single person in the world, everyone would be saved. 
If he died for the sins of everyone in the world, no one would have to pay in hell for their sins again. However, we do have to address the fact that there are a number of verses that on their surface seem to say, Jesus died for the world, Jesus died for all. So we do have to look at it. Now, I only have time to address a couple of verses, uh, more superficially than I'd like, but there are passages that do say Jesus died for all or Jesus died for the world. The question, though, and this is what you have to get, is what do they mean by all, what do they mean by world? Do, do, do they mean every single person? Here's a couple of them. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. 1 John 2, 1 and 2. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. Two things. First, an Arminian interpretation of these verses, you have to read these verses with an extra word in there, potential, potential salvation, potential redeemer. And Armenians do not believe everyone's saved. So they say, these verses say, he offers potentially to be the saviour, he offers potentially to be the redeemer. I don't think that's a straightforward understanding of these verses. Imagine you're working at a swimming pool as a lifeguard, and you look up and you see two boys in trouble. And you throw each one a life preserver and you say, grab it, save yourself. And one lad reaches out, takes a life preserver and is saved and the other one drowns. Are you going on Instagram, Twitter and saying, saviour of the boys? One of them drowned. You can't say you're a saviour of both. And in fact, you weren't really the saviour of the other boy. You could say, assisted in salvation of the boy. I threw a life preserver near him. In my understanding, reading these verses the way the Arminians want us to, means he's not actually saviour, not actually redeemer, he's just potentially saviour or redeemer. Secondly, we need to understand how language works. In English, the way we use all and the way we use world, it's, it's very broad. If I said, before they all went out, I want all the kids to come down the front, I don't mean every child in the world, I mean every child in here. If I said soccer is the world game, I don't mean every single person in the world plays it. I mean it's played by people throughout the world. Now, it's even broader in Greek. Consider the word all, or in Greek it's the word pass. Now, let me say this. Preachers are prone to exaggeration. Passionate Calvinist and Arminian preachers are the worst. One common Arminian exaggeration, if you've ever heard it, you will have heard this, the pulpit is banged and they will say, all means all and that's all it means. Really? It's a great sound bite. Do your own study, it is just manifestly not true. In fact, it would be far more accurate for me to stand up here and yell, all, rarely if ever, means all. The word all, it's used 1,200 times, over 1,200 times in the New Testament. For the Arminian view to be correct, when it's used about salvation, it has to mean every single person. Now, do your own study. It is doubtful that all is ever used of people in the sense of every single person. Let me just give you a few. Here are some of the ways all is used. All without exception is found, it's pretty rare, but it's talking about everything. It's not just talking about people. John 1, 3, all things were created through him. That's a very rare use, and it's not talking about people, it's talking about everything. The closest we can find to meaning all people is all meaning both Jews and Gentiles. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, don't get me wrong, Paul does mean to convey that every single person has sinned, but he's using all here to say, hey, Jewish brothers, we've got to understand it's not just the Gentiles who are sinners, we are too, it's all Jews and Gentiles. We know this. Romans 3.9, Paul said, we've already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. So here he's saying, for all, both Gentiles and we Jews have sinned. Now, the other ways all is used, 
are the majority of uses, but here's another one, all of those mentioned. Matthew 1.17, so all the generations from David to Abraham to David were 14 generations. Actually, there were a lot more than 14. Matthew means all 14 that I mentioned. Now, it's in there. It's also somewhat rare. What are the common uses of all? All where a part represents the whole. Matthew 4.8, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. It doesn't mean he stood on the mountain and every single kingdom in the world throughout all the ages was shown to him. No, the kingdoms he could see were representative of all kingdoms. And now we come to the really common uses in Scripture. All meaning many, but not every single one. Mark 1, 4 and 5. John came baptising. All the Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and they were baptised by him. Clearly it doesn't mean every single person came out and was baptised. No, it's hyperbole. We use it this way in English all the time. All of Queensland were barracking for the Maroons, if only. <laughs> it's a much more common use, many, but not everyone. And here's the really common use, all meaning all kinds. Let me give you some non-people uses. Acts 10, 12. In it were all the four-footed animals and reptiles of the earth and all the birds of the sky. Peter didn't look at this blanket and see every single animal in there. He saw all kinds of animals. 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is a root of all evil. He doesn't mean every sin that any of us ever commit finds its root in money. No, most of the translations add in kind. He means it's a root of all kinds of evils. Now, this is the way when it is used with people that it is most commonly used. And it's this, used this way in a number of our disputed passages. To decide on what the meaning in any particular passage is, you've got to look at the context. Let me give you an example. 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 6. I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions and thanksgivings be made for all, for kings and all those who are in authority. This is good and it pleases God our Saviour who wants all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. There's one God, one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all a testimony at the proper time. I urge prayers be made for all. What's Paul saying? Hey, Logan, each of you has to have a seven billion person prayer list get cracking. No. When you read on, he means, hey, pray for all kinds of people. In fact, even pray for the king kind and the those in authority kind of people, the ones who are persecuting you. God wants people to be saved from all kinds, all races, all nations, all social groupings, and Jesus gave himself a ransom for all these kinds of people, rich people, poor people, men, women, Jews, Gentiles. Similarly, the word world has many uses. I couldn't tell you how many times we're discussing the extent of the atonement and somebody says, I can end this debate now, John 3, 16. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son. Limited time, it's clearly wrong. Really. For them, world can only ever mean every single person. So God obviously sent Jesus to die for every person. Again, all you've got to do is open your Bible and have a look at how world is used, and in particular, how John uses it. It's found 185 times in the New Testament. In the Gospel of John, 78 times. In John's three epistles, a further 24. John's the big user of this word, and he uses it in many different ways. Let me show you some of them. He uses it of the whole creation, John 1.10. He was in the world, and the world was created through him. He uses it of just this planet we live on, John 21, 25. Many other things Jesus did, which they are written down, I suppose not even the world could contain the books. You know, this planet couldn't even contain them. Here's the really common use in John. Our fallen world. John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. John 15, 18. If the world hates you, understand it hated me, before it hated you. That's the really common use. But there are other uses. 
Again, John used it of a large group, but not everyone. John 12, 19, the Pharisees said to one another, you see, you've accomplished nothing. Look, the world's gone after him. And it's used of Jews and Gentiles. John 4, 42, they told the woman, this is the Samaritan woman at the well, we no longer believe because of what you said since we've heard for ourselves. And no, this really is the saviour of the world. He's not just the Jewish saviour, he's our saviour as well. The question then is, okay, John 3.16, how's it used? I want to suggest that in the context, it simply cannot mean every single person. Why? Because you only have to read on one verse to verse 17, and putting that meaning in there would make it meaningless. God did not send Jesus into every person. That meaning doesn't fit. What meaning fits? Well, the one who formed the creation left heaven to enter this fallen world. Why? To redeem it. That's John's whole point in John 1. What John is saying is this. God's love is so amazing, he sent his son into our fallen creation to save it, to redeem it. And he does it not by redeeming every person, but by calling out a new people. And he calls this group those who believe. So God's love is expressed in this way. He's got this general love for the fallen creation that leads to a specific love for those who are called and believe. Now, John regularly distinguishes between the fallen world and those who are called out of the fallen world. Let me give you an example, John 17, 9. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world. I'm not praying for the fallen creation, but for those you've given me out of the fallen world because they're yours. Look, God loves the world, but he loves it in a different way to the narrow group, those he gave to Christ, those he called. Well, somebody wants to say, well, what about 1 John 2, 1 and 2? Jesus Christ, the righteous one, he himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. Give me just only have to ask, by what does John mean every single last person? No. Look, read the context that this is in, and then read the parallel passage in John. John 11, 51, 52. Jesus was going to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to unite the scattered children of God. And in case you missed it, let me put it up. You have these parallel passages, and the context and the parallel passage make it clear. When he says Jesus atoned for our sins, he's talking about us the Jews, and for the sins of the world, the Gentiles. Look, all this, and I've been a long time getting there, to say all and world are used in Scripture in many different ways, and you've got to look at the context to see which use of it is the one in that context. Now, do your own study. In my opinion, no verse in its context says Jesus died for every single person. I know a surface reading seems to say otherwise until you actually look at how those words are used. Now, I would have liked to stop there, but I know the Arminians among us would say, you haven't addressed the biggies. So I don't know if they're the same here as at Holland Park, so I asked our Arminian friends, what are your biggies? And here are their two biggies. I've got to mention them, otherwise I'm getting emails. Can I say, if you want to send an email, Dave loves emails. Um, yeah. So here they are, 1 Timothy 4.10. We have put our hope in the living God, who is saviour of all people, especially of those who believe. They say, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. He's saviour of all, especially believers, not only believers. Yeah. It only begs the question, what does it mean he's saviour of all when not everyone's saved? A minion has to add in our word potentially, potentially saviour of all, but in reality only of those who believe. But that's not what this verse says. In its context here, I'd argue strongly saviour has a broader meaning, more akin to benefactor. It's a common use in the first century. It was a common title of Caesar. Paul's saying God, not Caesar, is the true benefactor of all people, pouring common grace on them. And God also pours something uh, Caesar and no one else can, a special benefaction. He saves. 
What about 2 Peter 2.1? Whoops, sorry, I'll go back. Um, there were indeed false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They'll bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them will bring swift destruction on themselves. I mean, you say, see, see, Jesus redeems some who end up lost, so that means he redeems everybody, and it also means you can lose your salvation. Now, again, you've got to ask the question, what does it mean he redeems them and loses them. What does that say about Jesus? But I don't believe Peter's talking about the cross and that kind of salvation here at all. Read the context. Master who bought them. These are words associated with the Exodus. Israel was said to be a nation purchased by the master out of slavery. And after the Exodus, false prophets arose, denying the master who delivered them. If you read on in 2 Peter 2, what he does, he gives all these examples of Old Testament deliverances and false teachers, false prophets. It seems he's saying, hey, just as some Jewish false prophets arose then, so some have arisen in his day. They deny the Lord who brought them as a nation. They deny their heritage as Jews by denying the gospel that came through the Jews, and in this way they bring destruction on themselves. Now look, I'd be here for hours literally to go through every text in detail. I will say absolutely Arminians do desire to be faithful to the text I will say there are texts that are hard to understand and yes there are plenty other texts that I wish I had time to deal with but here's what I want to say I've looked at these I believe in their context no verse says Jesus died for every single person ever born I'm passing the baton to you you do your own study make up your own mind What's the other main reason limited atonement is questioned? There are different ways to protect God's glory. Now, here's what I want to stress. Arminians and Calvinists both love God, and they both want to protect the glory of his name. But they take different approaches. See, what are they trying to do here? There is a question, and I guarantee you've asked yourself this question, because I sure have, And it's a question that, from our human perspective, doesn't look so good for God. The question is this. Since God could save everyone, why didn't he? Calvinists and Arminians are united in saying this. Could God save everyone? Yes. Did God save everyone? No. Arminians and Calvinists both have an answer to this and it seeks to preserve the glory of God. Now, I'm going to show you both of these answers. When I put them up, I suspect you're not going to like either of them, because from a man-centered perspective, they're not that flash, either of them. Now, in my opinion, I want to suggest one's actually scriptural, and if you change your perspective from man-centered to God-centered, one you will rejoice in. But for what it's worth, here they are. Arminianism says God's glory is diminished if he takes away human self-determination. Calvinism says God's glory is diminished if he does not display his glorious majesty and dreadful awe. And you're probably going, I don't understand either of these, so I'm going to explain them. Now, I want to point out, I've done a lot of study, I can't find anywhere in Scripture where God's election of some but not others is linked to human self-determination There are a lot of places, in particular Romans 9, where it's linked to his glory. But let me tease this out and see if you can follow it. Imagine a wealthy man has this home. It's surrounded by fences and there are signs plastered all over the fences saying, keep out, warning, dangerous pond, enter at your own risk. Three young boys ignore the signs, climb the fence, they begin to vandalise the man's property, abuse his animals, They come across the owner, they attack him, they come across his son, they spit on him. And they run off, they're walking by the edge of the pond, when all three fall into the pond, they can't get out, and they're quickly on the verge of drowning. Their desperate cries attract the owner's attention. He comes to the edge of the pond and he says, Well, boys, saw the fences, didn't you? Saw all the signs warning you about the pond, didn't you? You ignored them didn't you? You attack me, you attack my son, you vandalise my stuff, and now let me get this straight. You've trespassed, 
You've attacked me. You've attacked my property. You've disrespected me, and now you want me to save you. What would we say if that man just turned around and walked away? What would we think of him? Would we say, well, those boys got what they deserved? No, we wouldn't. We'd say that man's merciless. Yeah, the boys were stupid, they were wicked, but they don't deserve death. The owner should save them. He should get over it. Here's the issue. The Bible says God is rich in mercy. And God does act, but at the end of the day, not everyone's saved. Why and how does this not make God merciless? Arminianism preserves God's honour by picturing God as a property owner who could save all the boys, who wants to save all the boys, but who says, you know what, I would not be good if I violated their free will, their right to choose to save themselves. So what he does, he throws a life preserver near each of the boys and says, I urge you, save yourself if you can. And he stands by not knowing if one, two, three, or none of the boys will live. It's crucial to him that they choose to save themselves. Now, personally, I struggle to accept that man's free will is worth creating a universe where most do not choose God and are in hell forever. You make your own mind up. Calvinism has a different answer. Unfortunately, Calvinism's answer is usually portrayed in a way that sounds cruel. It's often pictured as if the man said, fine, all right, because I'm merciful, I'll save one of you. And he dives in, drags one boy to safety and leaves the other two and expects to be praised. Arminians would say, really? We should applaud him for just saving one boy? Well, here's what I would say. No, if God were obligated to act as you and I, as men and women are obligated to act, we would rightly say, yes, he's merciless, he's evil, as well as unnecessarily partial. He could have saved them all. He should have saved them. Here's the problem with that illustration. It's entirely man-centred. It says, if I acted that way, I'm merciless. So if God acts that way, he's merciless. No. No. I'm not God and neither are you. I'm a man created in God's image. As such, I am obligated to help those created in the image and likeness of God. I cannot shed the blood of someone created in God's image. Failing to save someone created in God's image is a monumental issue. It is my obligation as a created being to help them. It is my obligation. But God's not a man. Here's what you've got to understand. He is not obligated to anyone or anything except to his glory. He's not obligated to save you or anyone. He's not obligated to do for anyone what he does for one. For what he does for one, he does not have to do for all. He owes us nothing. What does this mean? Yeah, it would be wrong for me to let those boys drown because I'm obligated to save them. Saying a creature created in the image of God brings glory. Saying you deserve to drown would make me wicked. But God is not under such obligation. His only obligation, and Scripture is so clear on this, is to bring and do what will bring him glory. It guides his actions. See, in this illustration, the sin of the boys, it, it's somewhat trivial. They, they disobeyed some signs. They climbed a fence. They're youthful. It's a mistake. Of course, they don't deserve to be left to drown. Punishment doesn't fit the crime. You and I, our punishment absolutely fits the crime. We sin every single day of our life against the only holy being. We robbed him of glory. We robbed him of the obedience we owe him. Our punishment absolutely fits our crime. When they're drowning, these boys were going, we're sorry, save us. We don't do that. We say, we still hate you. In fact, Revelation says, even those in hell are still saying that. Romans 1, we call evil good. We defame God's glory. See, we need to let God be God. Here's what the Bible says. It is only fitting that rebels display the glory of God for all eternity by showing the necessary weight of their punishment for all eternity. 
Our sin is infinite in its unrighteousness. Our punishment must be infinite. See, here's what the Bible says. It says, by saving some, heaven declares for all eternity the love and the mercy of God. And for allowing some to continue in their unrighteousness, hell declares for all eternity the holiness and justice of God. And who are we to say, hey, we do not think God's holiness and justice should be displayed forever. Who are we to say this is not the right course of action? This is exactly the argument Paul makes in Romans 9. He's answering the question, why isn't every single person in Israel saved? Here's his answer, Romans 9, 11 to 23. For though her sons had not yet been, uh, yet been born yet or done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to election might stand, she was told, as it's written, I've loved Jacob, but I've hated Esau. Now, the context there is clear. I don't have time to go into it. It's not nations. It's individuals. It's dealing with salvation, not choosing a nation. But boy, it's a hard verse. God chose to love Jacob and hate Esau before they were born, before they'd done anything good or evil. Now, remember, remember, God did love Esau with a common grace love. He did, when you read the account, turn him into a great nation. But in terms of saving love, he chose not to love Esau. He chose to leave him in his rebellion. Esau chose that rebellion. God left him there. Does that make God unjust? Paul says, absolutely not. He tells Moses, I'll show mercy to whom I'll show mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. Has the potter no right over the clay to make from the same lump one piece of pottery for honour and another for dishonour. And what if God, wanting to display his wrath and to make known his power, endured with much patience objects of wrath prepared for destruction? And what if he did this to make known the riches of his glory on objects of mercy that he prepared beforehand for glory? Paul says he's not obligated. He's not obligated to do any particular thing with any lump of clay. If he does one to show his mercy and one to show his wrath, that's his choice. And no lump of clay can say, but that's unfair. No, those in hell got exactly what they deserved. That is very fair. No one in hell saying, I didn't deserve this. In neither case is God unjust. He chose to save some who deserve condemnation by satisfying the law in the cross. And others he leaves in their rebellion. Ultimately, why he chose to love Jacob but not Esau, we don't know. I can't answer that. In fact, Paul gets right to the end and says, hey, I don't know either. Secret things belong to the Lord. Now, I know that sounds very cold on paper. I mean, we're talking about heaven and hell for real people. I want them all to be saved. You want them all to be saved. I want all my unsaved friends and relatives in glory. And it breaks my heart to think of anyone in hell. Stuns me to think that I'm going to be in heaven. I do not deserve it. We don't like this doctrine because we go, that's not how I would act, therefore it's not how God should act. We should love this doctrine because it's exactly how the only ultimate being should act. You make up your own mind. Personally, I find Arminian's answer unsatisfying. God knows the future perfectly, including who will and will not truly, uh, freely choose Christ and who will be punished eternally. Yet despite knowing this, he chooses to create the world. He chooses to give people free will. He will not violate their free will and he will punish those who reject Jesus. Look, it's hard. I freely admit that. And it's really hard because we see things from such a human perspective. It's hard to see things from a divine, perfect being's perspective. But here's what I do know and believe with all my heart. One day, I'm going to be in glory and I'm going to see things through God's eyes and God's perspective. And then I'm going to rejoice at the election of some and the hardening of some because it will display the glorious majesty and the dreadful awe of God for all eternity. Brings us to our final point, and this is a lot shorter. Hang in there. Why limited atonement matters? Two reasons. First, it insists all the glory for salvation is Christ alone. Jesus did it all. I did nothing. 
All the glory is his. But in an Arminian view of salvation, I believed, I chose Jesus, so ultimately the reason I'm in heaven and my neighbour isn't is I believed. I did something. So I get some of the glory. Yet Jesus does a lot. He did most of it. But hey, I did my bit. Remember our illustration of the three drowning boys? The Arminians would say the ones who are saved, they did something. They saved themselves. Boys are crying out for help. In reality, no one's doing that. We're saying, God, we do not want you. We don't want your saviour. We don't want it. Leave it us alone. In Arminianism, it's not as if the man dives in and saves the boys. He just makes them savable, throws the life preserver near them and says, save yourself. The Bible says we'd never choose to save ourselves. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. We cannot do anything to aid our salvation. Dead people can't do anything. Read Revelation 5. When we get to eternity, there is the song of redemption. And every single saint sing it. And they're singing, you were slaughtered and you purchased with your blood people from every tribe, tongue, people and nation. There is not one word of, oh yes, but I did my bit, hallelujah, praise me, that's why I'm here. Not a word of that. Secondly, it affirms the atonement as personal, complete and eternal. He personally saved me. The love of Jesus is intimate. Imagine you fall in love with three sisters, Jane, Josie and Jenny. And you're not sure, so you gather them together and you say, girls, love you all. And if any of you love me, I'll marry you. And Josie says, oh, oh, me, I love you, marry me. So they marry how special does Josie feel? Eh, not that special. You love the sisters just as much. She'd feel a lot more special if you'd went to her and said, Josie, I love you. I choose you. Will you be my wife? See, one of the foundational doctrines of the cross is called penal substitutionary atonement. Penal, he bore our penalty. Substitutionary, he died in my place. It's that word substitutionary that is crucial here. He died in my place. The Bible clearly teaches that when we are united with Christ by faith, at the cross we're united with him, and as he dies, we die. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Romans 6, I die with Christ. I'm in Christ as he dies. The wrath of God is poured on me and my sins are atoned for. It changes substitutionary atonement entirely to say, Jesus died for the sins of the world. Because at the cross, Jesus was not the substitute for the entire world. Unlimited atonement says, oh, well, here's how it works. He potentially died for the world. He, he stored up enough merit to pay for all the world. And then afterwards, when we have faith, it's applied to me and he dies for me. Depersonalizes the cross changes what happened at the cross. He's not directly my substitute. He died for everyone, not just for me. But I want to say, I tell you, Scripture says he died for me. It's a particular love, not a general love. He died in my place. He took my sins, my shame, my rebellion, my guilt. Ephesians 5.25, he loved the church and gave himself for her. Not the world, the church. He's my beloved. He's my shepherd. He's my saviour. He came for me, He saw me, he loved me. I belong to Jesus. He adopted me, he died for me, he redeemed me. I'm his. Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. He loved me and gave himself for me. For me. He completely saved me. Arminians don't teach the cross alone actually saves anyone. They say, Oh, you can be potentially saved, but then it requires your faith, your obedience. Robs Christ to the full glory and salvation. I want to say, do not hold to a cross that potentially saves. You hold to one that completely and absolutely saves. And finally, he eternally saved me. If salvation is potentially up to me, then my soul is in grave danger. Arminian theology undermines assurance. If my salvation's up to me and my faithfulness and me clinging to him... I've got no assurance of salvation, but it's not. He died to save me, and he says, I'll lose no one that I came for, none. Spurgeon, got to leave you with a Spurgeon, don't we? Yep. 
Spurgeon said it so well. We say Christ so died that he infallibly secured the salvation of a multitude that no man can number, who through Christ's death not only may be saved, but are saved, must be saved, and cannot by any possibility run the hazard of being anything but saved. Amen. That's why I love this doctrine. It's incredibly precious, and I pray it becomes precious to you as well. Why don't we pray? Father, this is so much to get our heads around, but when we boil it down, we find this precious truth. Christ came for me. He loved me. He died for me. He took all my sin, all my shame, all my rebellion and bore it in the cross. Lord, that is so precious. May it become ever more precious as we remember these truths. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.